Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If you could take a seat, if you could find one. I am Gail Harriet, chair of the Civil Rights Practice Group, uh, and I have two things to say really quickly before we get started. First, you too can be active in the Federalist Society Civil Rights Practice Group. If you are interested, talk to Dean Reuter or Liz Siri after this, this presentation, uh, or email any of us. Um, second, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator today, Rachel Brand. Um, it is a very easy job since Rachel is familiar to most of you as a member of the Federalist Society's leadership uh, for many years now. Um, if somehow you missed the news earlier this year, um, she is now Associate Attorney General of the United States of America, one of many very great appointments of the Trump administration. One more thing, though. Um, as with many of the Trump appointments, the vote um, in the Senate was not unanimous. I mean, go figure, Abraham Lincoln could not get a unanimous vote out of these people these days. But let's make sure that her welcome is absolutely Federalist Society unanimous. Good to see everybody. It's always good to be here at the Federalist Society. I, for some years, served as the chairman of the litigation practice group and had the role that, that Gail has, has here today. So this is a great turnout, um, and I'm delighted to be here with, with such a distinguished panel of experts on this topic of, of race and sex as drivers of the administrative state. My role is simply as the moderator. I'm going to introduce the panelists, each of whom will give a six to eight minute opening presentation. I may ask some questions or ask them to respond to each other, and then at about 1.30, we'll open it up for questions from the audience, and then we'll end at 2 o'clock. All right, so Gail Harriet, who is very well known here to the Federal Society, will go first. She is a current commissioner on the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. She has a long career in academia, including many years on the George Mason University and San Diego School of Law faculties, where she teaches and writes on civil rights matters and torts. She's also been a lawyer in private practice. She worked for the Senate Judiciary Committee, and she clerked for Judge Seymour Simon on the Illinois Supreme Court. Speaking second will be Professor Theodore Shaw, who's a law professor. I'm, uh, are you going second, Ted? Yeah. You are, OK. Uh, law professor and director of the Center for Civil Rights at UNC Law School. He has a distinguished career in academia at other schools as well, including the U University of Michigan and Columbia before joining UNC. He spent 26 years at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, serving in many capacities, ultimately including president of the organization. Speaking third will be Professor Shep Melnick uh, of the uh, Boston College. He's a professor of American political science. He teaches on a wide variety of poli-sci topics and is an expert on uh, administrative uh, uh, government. He's also taught at several other schools, including Harvard and Brandeis. And then finally, uh, right here to my right, Peter Kersenow, another current commissioner on the Civil Rights Commission, serving in his third term. He is also a former member of the NLRB under President uh, Bush, and has decades of experience in private practice uh, where he practices both labor and employment law. All of their bios are in longer form in your program. And so we'll start out uh, with Gail. Um, the theme of this conference is, of course, uh, the administrative state uh, and its phenomenal growth uh, over the last century. That includes a focus um, on the bad stuff, uh, its tendency towards overregulation, uh, and its anti-democratic tendencies. Uh, the thesis we're talking about on this civil rights panel um, is this. Uh, for both good and bad reasons, a significant part of the expansion of the administrative state has been driven by issues of race and sex. Now, some of that is obvious and good. There have been a lot of, of civil rights legislation in the last 60 years when that legislation is well drafted, with due attention to the difficulties inherent in governance by administrative agencies, and when it is faithfully executed, it will create administrative activity. You know, that's fine. Uh, but a lot of it's not like that. Um, some of the legislation 
is not so well drafted. Um, and even when it is well drafted, it's not always faithfully executed. There's something about race and sex issues from the transgender locker room guidance on down, advocates of limited government and of the notion that policy should be, be set for our, by our elected representatives um, and rather than administrative agencies. Um, they've been especially ineffective at reining in the excesses of the administrative state when dealing with, um, or when the administrative state purports to be dealing with, um, issues of race and sex. And part of the reason um, is that our elected representatives, when they do try to intervene, uh, they get called racist or sexist, and well, you know, they, they don't like that. Uh, whether their reticence is political prudence uh, or moral cowardice um, is your call. You know, it's complicated and it's not, I don't think there's a single answer to that question. Um, another part of the reason for that ineffectiveness, though, um, is that too many conservative leaders don't think race and sex are important issues. Uh, they see it as off to the side somewhere, um, even something that can be safely ignored, and that's a mistake. Um, the mistake has two sides to it. Uh, part is that conservative leaders, and here I mean not just political leaders, but religious leaders, civic leaders, um, lawyers at the Federalist Society, whatever. Um, as a group, we have not done a great job um, at appreciating the difficulty of the task of bringing African Americans and other minorities, and to a lesser extent women, um, into the mainstream. There are some notable exceptions, um, including some in this room. Uh, but hence, we haven't put as much effort as I would have preferred into articulating uh, the conservative vision um, into how to smooth the way. There are many people in our country today who are tempted by the siren call of identity politics. Um, some of their concerns are legitimate, they just need a little reformation of those, a little rechanneling. Uh, if looking at their concerns through the identity, through the lens of race and sex or through the lens of identity politics is the wrong way, and I think it is, what's the right way? What's the conservative way to look at their concerns? Um, second, Conservative leaders have been very bad at recognizing when progressive policies on race and sex are leading us um, in a direction. Um, they've been, been, been bad at recognizing that the direction that those policies are leading us um, is not a good direction. It leads to race and sexual resentments. It leads to identity politics. Uh, and again, there are notable exceptions among conservatives here, some of them in the room. Um, after decades of these policies, when the predictable results happen, uh, too many people shrug their shoulders and wonder how it happened. Uh, I wish I had time to talk about all the examples of the administrative agencies run amok on civil rights issues, but I'm just one panelist here with eight minutes, and we're going to have to share the pain here on the panel instead. Um, I'm going to confine myself to one of the original issues, and that is Title VII and disparate impact, because I think it fits the administrative agency theme best. Uh, back in 1964, when Congress passed Title VII, uh, it was understood by Republicans, and I think Democrats too, uh, to be a relatively small tweak to the common law that employment relationships uh, were at will unless the parties agreed otherwise, which they often did. Uh, that is, the employer and the employee, or the job applicant, uh, could enter or exit an employment relationship for good reason, bad reason, or no reason at all. Um, supporters of Title VII understood it as saying, yeah, sure, good reason, bad reason, or no reason at all, so long as the employer is not motivated by race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. They didn't want, back in 1964, they didn't want the EEOC or the courts second-guessing employers, unless the court finds the employer is motivated by one of those five criteria. Because second-guessing about complex human relationships is usually going to be guessing wrong, which is why we don't have an office of spousal selection or office of best friends. Not yet, anyway. Um, we tend to think that governments choosing your mates, choosing your close associates, uh, is not such a great idea, except in very special circumstances. Um, but within just a few years of Title VII's passage, the EEOC, in part motivated by the belief that it must do something fast about the unrest in urban centers back in the late 60s, 
uh, they invented disparate impact liability, which looked not at the employer's intent to discriminate by race or sex in choosing particular job qualifications, but rather the effects that those job qualification choices will have. If a given job qualification had a disparate impact, it was presumptively a violation of Title VII. It was up to the employer to rebut that presumption by showing that it had a business necessity, which turned out to be a pretty high standard. After all, they're talking a necessity here. It didn't matter whether the employer, either consciously or unconsciously, was motivated by race. Um, it was a question of disparate impact. As far as I'm aware, historians have agreed that this is not what Congress had intended. But the Supreme Court nevertheless deferred to the EEOC in its interpretation of Title VII in Griggs versus Duke Power Company. Perhaps the biggest problem with disparate impact liability is that, wait for it, all job qualifications have a disparate impact on some protected group. Remember, there are a lot of religions, a lot of national origin groups out there. As a group, men are stronger than women, while women are, are, are generally more capable of fine handiwork. Chinese and Korean Americans score higher on standardized math tests and other measures of mathematical ability than most other national origin groups. Unitarians are much more likely to have a college degree than Baptists. It's a complicated world. Did you know, for example, and this is Thomas Sowell's favorite one, so I love to give it to, Cambodian Americans are disproportionately likely to have experience in the donut industry. Um, <laughs> so here's the rub. In 1964, the 88th Congress was very concerned about creating an administrative agency to enforce Title VII that would be too powerful in their view. The decision to deny the EEOC substantive rulemaking power was very, very deliberate. But soon after the EEOC opened for business, um, it began issuing various kinds of substantive guidances, they called them, interpreting Title VII. Not subject to notice and comment, not easily challenged in court, because in theory they are not final agency actions. They're just helpful advice on how the agency interprets the statute or which violations they consider most serious. But an employer would have to be rock stupid to ignore a guidance without an extremely good reason, especially after the early 1970s when the authority to bring pattern and practice uh, litigation was transferred from the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice to the EEOC. An excellent way to get the EEOC to sue an employer is for the employer to ignore the EEOC's helpful guidances. An EEOC official even bragged back in the, in the 70s that these interpretations, um, through them, the agency was able to transform an apparently weak agency into a strong one. And that same guy bragged that the agency wasn't really all that concerned about whether the courts would agree with the guidances. Uh, but look at what you get when you combine the fact that every job qualification has a disparate impact um, with the EEOC's aggressive use of guidances backed up by the threat of litigation. The EEOC can issue a guidance claiming correctly that any employer practice, any employer practice, um, Anyone that it doesn't like is having or could have a disparate impact. It has nearly complete discretion to prohibit any kind of job qualification if it really wants to. And it can be more or less retroactive. Think about what that means with regard to the rule of law and for the notion that we are governed by our elected representatives. A good example, and I think that, that, that um, Pete Kersenow will elaborate on this, uh, is the EEOC's criminal background check guidance. Knock me over with a feather if Congress at any time intended to limit employer discretion to determine whether to hire uh, a job applicant with a criminal record. The whole point of Title VII is that employers need to choose employees based on their actual record rather than their race or sex, and criminal record is certainly part of that. I happen to believe the federal government should have programs that help reintegrate uh, those who serve their time back into society. I am a fan of the tax deduction for this purpose because employers who want to participate get to self-select in that program. Um, this should never have been cast as a race issue under Title VII. 
I am going to stop there because no less an authority than the Associate Attorney General uh, will cause the gavel to come down upon me. My bottom line is that representative democracy, the rule of law, as well as fairness, justice, and economic prosperity all depend on conservatives paying more attention to civil rights law and policy, as well as more attention um, to how to address the legitimate concerns of those who might otherwise be inclined to frame their concerns in terms of identity politics. Thank you. So, uh, a number of us agreed that we would uh, rather sit on our duffs um, uh, than stand at the podium um, and uh, do this panel thing, but um, let me first say that I'm honored to be here. Uh, I don't know how long I've been coming to Federal Society uh, conventions, and sometimes I leave feeling like a, a liberal or progressive pinata. Um, uh, sometimes I um, have uh, left steamed and uh, upset and angry, and other times I feel like uh, there's been a good discourse. Um, uh, I'm probably, uh, as time goes on, uh, even more and more inclined to have these kinds of opportunities. Uh, unlike what many people say, uh, there are a lot of people who disagree philosophically and ideologically, I'm one of them, who believe that uh, it is important to have discourse uh, and disagreement. And the other thing is, is that the um, the labels that we either take on or wear or other people put on us uh, are often um, insufficient. Uh, you know, to call oneself, uh, oneself a conservative or a liberal doesn't quite capture the, all the nuances of um, the, the thoughts, the beliefs, the struggles that uh, we have over a range of issues. Having said that, uh, I know I disagree with um, almost everybody on this panel, if not everybody, on some important points. Uh, Gail and I have had our exchanges in the past. I hope to continue to have them in the future. Uh, but let me just share uh, a few thoughts, and there was one that I want to end with uh, that I really thought about starting with, and so I want to make sure I get to that. Uh, I know that's in my own hands. Um, so. Uh, the term identity politics, which is much more popular now and is kind of like the flavor of the day, um, uh, is uh, a term that I don't remember. Uh, at least uh, 10, 20, 15 years ago, certainly when I started practicing civil rights law. And it's a loaded term. Uh, and it's a term that generally is being thrown at people who think of themselves as more progressive or uh, you know, who do civil rights uh, work, or uh, more specifically, particularly, uh, though I may be wrong about this, uh, you know, it feels like it's being loaded and thrown at uh, people of color, particularly African Americans. Um, if it's a term that has any use at all, I can tell you that black folks didn't invent what we call identity politics. Um, I hope I don't need to explain that anymore, but uh, question and answers, uh, you know, you can come at me and question and answers, and I'll explain it if need be. Um, uh, the fact is, is that uh, we now um, are, as I often point out, uh, we're now uh, 398 years um, after the arrival of the first Africans involuntarily at Jamestown. Another way of putting that is that we are two years short of the 400th anniversary. Uh, I've been thinking about this for a long time. And when I think about the continuum with respect to uh, subordination under law uh, in this country, uh, the con it is a continuum. Uh, it's not the, the view that many people have that slavery ended in 1865. Uh, it did. Um, uh, although some people will point out that it has continued by another name. There's even a book, Slavery by Another Name. Uh, you can read that and look at that. But uh, the continuum, of course, is Jim Crow segregation, subordination by law, uh, if we think about our country, uh, didn't end uh, until the late 1960s, right around 1970, 
and uh, then we saw ushering in a period of attack uh, in the form of anti-affirmative action, et cetera, a, uh, a rebuff of school desegregation, et cetera. But the administrative state that Gail is talking about with respect to race only began to take form uh, in the late 1950s uh, with the passage of the Civil Rights Act and then, of course, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, Titles II, um, Title IV, uh, Title um, uh, VII uh, in particular, more about Title VII. And then, of course, uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, one could think about the enforcement of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which did take part of uh, the administrative state, the government, uh, the uh, Justice Department Civil Rights Division, uh, you know, under the Attorney General's authority with respect to the enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. And then, of course, uh, the 1968 uh, Civil Rights Act, Fair Housing, all of HUD's Fair Housing Responsibilities, um, is um, or do those um, provisions require governmental enforcement efforts? Of course they do. Of course they do. Uh, how would these measures be enforced uh, if not by the government? Uh, the reality is, is that voluntary cessation of racial discrimination in this country is simply not uh, a major cause of what abandonment we've had of uh, the uh, segregative state on the federal or the local level. The question isn't whether or not the government has a role to play. The question is, what is that role? Uh, for most of those um, 350 years before the end of the 60s, it was a role that was segregative. Uh, I'm not going to go into it now because this isn't the time. Doesn't, we don't have the, it is the time and the place, but we don't have it. Uh, the, um, uh, the segregation as it exists uh, in this country that we take for granted and don't even think about uh, didn't happen uh, accidentally or depending on your point of view serendipitously. It is the consequence, uh, and I'm talking about housing segregation but other forms, of years and years, decades and decades of governmental action on the state, local, and federal level uh, that have interacted with the deeds of private actors to create the segregation that we see today. Uh, so we've only begun to address this over the last 48 or 50 years, depending on how you count. Uh, and uh, if you do the math, um, this is why I did the introduction I did, we're talking about uh, somewhere 84%, uh, 88% of the days of the existence of uh, people of African descent in what's now the United States have been spent under uh, uh, either uh, slavery or Jim Crow segregation, governmental subordination. So we've only begun to have the government play uh, another kind of role. Uh, let me say a few things um, uh, and then cease uh, with respect to uh, some of the provisions that I've alluded to. Title VII. Uh, <coughs> Title VII is a favorite target of conservatives uh, with respect to, uh, in particular, uh, the effect standard. Um, Gail, when you started out talking about how we got the effect standard, um, I thought you started out talking about it in terms of administrative agencies before you got to um, uh, the fact that the Supreme Court decided in Griggs v. Duke Power Company uh, that uh, there was an effects test. Um, and so I was ready to jump and, um, and make that correction, but didn't need to. You, you, uh, alluded to Griggs v. Duke Power Company. Um, but uh, that standard, whether it's applied in the context of employment or any other standard, but particularly employment, is not a standard that simply says that um, if there's a difference uh, that we see with respect to the effect of a certain policy or practice, et cetera, that that is illegal. That's not quite the way it works. Uh, it opens, an, it's a starting point, it opens up an inquiry, and what Griggs v. Duke Power Company said um, was not that there's automatically a, uh, either a finding or a presumption of illegality, the question is whether or not the practice or the policy that has a, a discriminatory impact um, is one that is uh, justifiable, uh, whether it's a necessary practice or policy related to uh, the job function that one is in, engaged in. 
Uh, there, of course, is the rub. That's where we get into a lot of disagreements. Um, but I ask, as a starting point, um, what is it about asking the question whether or not a particular policy or practice is necessary if it has discriminatory or disparate impact that bothers people, except if you think that we shouldn't be using the time and the energy or expending that on uh, those kinds of matters because they're not important enough. If we do, and I suspect that with some folks uh, we might, uh, then we just have a different uh, point of view and we have different values about uh, what's important and what isn't. Uh, I uh, remind us again, or I certainly am conscious myself, of the, um, of, of the fact that we've only begun to root out the impact of these decades and decades and hundreds of years of racial subordination and inequality um, that still exist. Uh, you know, I've, I've come to the Federalist Society conventions, but also been engaged in other debates in which um, for years, uh, in recent years, we talked about whether or not race is still an issue, whether we've reached colorblind America. I'm not sure anybody in this room um, uh, would debate that nowadays, or if you did, I wouldn't really engage in that debate because I think it would be superfluous. Uh, but the point I'm making is that, uh, yes, we need the government, whether we're talking about Bob Jones University uh, you know, versus uh, IRS, whether we're talking about uh, the uh, effort to desegregate long-running Adams case, uh, you know, the federal government's responsibility with elementary and secondary education and colleges and universities, and we can talk about what was successful there and what wasn't, because there is a critique to level at the work that civil rights lawyers like those of us at the Legal Defense Fund did. Fair enough. Uh, but whether we talk about, um, you know, the, um, uh, the impact of policies that uh, segregate people in housing, and whether or not HUD has a role. I don't shrink from what's called the administrative state having a role in uh, all of those things if you believe that we still have work to do with respect to rooting out governmental inequality. Last thing, um, uh, 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 yeah, last thing. Uh, the, um, uh, I'm in North Carolina now, um, and Peter, whom I've bumped heads with many times, I hope you don't mind, uh, um, you know, we had a good catching up a uh, few moments. He asked me, how am I doing there? Well, just fine, thank you. My, lo my wife loves it, my kids love it. I love living in North Carolina. Um, but I said, my problem is the politics of North Carolina now. And there is a viciousness in the people who hold power in that state right now. And it's not only limited to North Carolina, but it is particularly true of North Carolina. Uh, the notion of crushing anybody and destroying anybody with which uh, one disagrees. Uh, you know, I look at the people who are in the legislature, on the board of governors, uh, in other places, um, and I ask myself, what kind of people are these? Um, when I see what they're doing and in the way they do it. If you're not clear about what I'm talking about, I'd be glad to talk to any of you about it. Uh, but the, um, the point that I'm ending on is this. Uh, there's a better way for us to engage in uh, discourse, in uh, talking about issues about which we disagree than the one that is characterized either in North Carolina politics or for that matter, our national politics. I may be naive, I may be. Uh, you know, it may be that when you're on the short end of the stick uh, these days, uh, you wanna believe in those things. Um, but I think uh, that if we don't find a better way to engage with one another, it's at all of our peril, at our national peril. I don't like the place where we are in um, as a country right now, and to be clear, uh, NFL protests notwithstanding, I may be wandering a, boat, uh, a, a bit, but not that much. Um, this is my country. Uh, I, am, I view myself and those who do this work uh, as as patriotic as anyone else is. Uh, not everybody believes that. There has to be a place for a special discourse when we talk about the continued um, uh, divisions uh, about race in this country because it remains 
if not our greatest dilemma, one of our nation's greatest dilemmas. And so it's in that context, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you here. Thank you. Good afternoon. I come before you with two disabilities. Um, one is I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a political scientist. I should probably add, I don't even consider myself a conservative. I've probably voted for Democrats as much as Ted has. I assume you vote mainly as I have. Um, also, I have an ear infection. I can't hear myself very well. So I hope my voice sounds better to you than it does to me. Um, in many ways, regulation of educational institutions under Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 illustrates all of the hazards of the administrative state uh, that Justice Gorsuch talked about last night. At the same time, though, I fear that the term administrative state is a misnomer, and I will try to point out how uh, talking in terms of the administrative state um, might hide from us some of the features of Title IX that definitely need to be addressed. Uh, most of the Obama administration's initiatives uh, under Title IX are probably familiar to all of you, so I won't go over them in detail. Uh, if you want a very detailed review, um, I have a forthcoming book called The Transformation of Title IX. You can have uh, 300 pages of detail, and you can pre-order it on Amazon. <laughs> but very quickly, um, uh, Title IX simply says that institutions that receive federal funding, educational funding, cannot discriminate on the basis of sex. The legislative history of this law is very sparse. It was a floor amendment. Uh, when President Nixon signed it in 1972, he didn't even mention Title IX, part of the omnibus bill. New York Times didn't even mention it when they were uh, explaining what Congress had passed. For many decades, the only controversial issue was athletics. Uh, and the reason for that was because that was the one area in most schools that we segregated by sex and we tried to figure out what separate but equal means in the area of athletics. Starting in 2010, the Obama administration uh, began a, a campaign to use both Title, VI and, uh, Title IX and Title VI to make major changes in federal education policy. I'm going to just focus here on, on uh, the sexual harassment, sexual assault rules, say a little bit about transgender. Uh, but in 2011 and 2014, as you probably know, the Obama administration issued a Dear Colleague letter and a detailed question and answer guidance document uh, that uh, required schools to take very dramatic action to address the problem of sexual harassment and sexual assault on campuses. What is best known is procedural requirements for people uh, involving people who are accused of sexual misconduct especially the preponderance of the ed evidence rule. Uh, but I think even more important has been many other features of this guidance. Um, the requirement of tr extensive training for basically everyone in the university and in public schools. Um, and I'd actually encourage you to read Emily Yoffa's Atlantic article on this um, to, so you get a sense of the type of training that is being required. Uh, and a really terrific law review article, California Law Review by Jeannie uh, Suk and uh, Jason Gerson on th what they call the sex bureaucracy. Uh, there are very extensive requirements for preventing sexual assault and sexual harassment. Services to schools, uh, not only to those people who have experienced sexual assault and sexual harassment on campus, but those who have experienced off campus even by non-students. The requirements have very elaborate rules about internal compliance offices requiring um, the creation of quite large units within universities that are largely autonomous from other parts of the university. Uh, and finally, I'll just say that this is not just about sexual conduct, it is about speech about sexual matters. Jokes, innuendos, um, disparaging comments about masculinity and, sec uh, and femininity, this is very far reaching. And it has been enforced through an enforcement procedure um, that is extremely expensive for universities, both in terms of, ter terms of time and reputation. And I think they're designed to do that. 
um, not to put too fine a point on it, but these investigations, which could last years, are meant to bludgeon schools into compliance. Uh, less consequential, but in some ways more dramatic, were the rules on transgender rights, um, in which the uh, uh, Office, of Civil Rights, uh, uh, Office for Civil Rights said that if, when schools have sex-segregated facilities, you must allocate those facilities on the basis of gender identity, not biological sex. Now, those have never take, uh, taken effect for various reasons, um, but really show that there is, was a very dramatic effort to change the way in which we think about sex in education. Now, this has a number of troubling features. I'm sure most of you are aware of this. One is, this was based, uh, these rules were based on a very sparse legislative record. I would say a weak to non-existent legislative basis. Um, for sexual harassment, the term sexual harassment wasn't even in use in 1972. That really didn't come until a number of years later. Now the courts, this is actually the point that Ted Shaw made about the courts and agencies, the courts did start in the 1970s to say that sexual harassment is a form of sexual discrimination. But they could never explain why, or they could never agree on why, um, and the why was important because it says what form regulation should take. Um, OCR didn't begin to say anything about sexual harassment until the 1990s, 25 years later. Um, and meantime, Congress had said absolutely nothing. Second problem, um, again, you're probably generally aware of this, all of these rules by the Obama administration, and I shouldn't single out the Obama administration because this is true of many previous administrations, did not use notice and comment rulemaking. They used dear colleague letters, other unilateral actions, um, and one of my favorite things is say, here's the rule, if you want to comment on it, you can do so now, after we've issued the rules. That's the opposite of notice and comment rulemaking. Um, they did this by claiming that there's nothing new here. Um, this was all just inherent in previous rules. At the same time, the White House was saying, this is groundbreaking legislation. Uh, to her credit, uh, Secretary DeVos has said that this is going to come to an end. Uh, the, the era of uh, uh, regulation um, uh, through letter, she said, is over, and um, I hope that she's able to accomplish that. Third point, and I think this is less well known, is that what, the, what OCR has done flies directly in the face of the way the Supreme Court has interpreted uh, Title IX on sexual harassment. The Supreme Court in two key cases said schools are liable for sexual harassment and sexual, other forms of, uh, and sexual violence only if uh, they had actual knowledge and were deliberately indifferent. That's a pretty lenient standard. But OCR has said uh, that they are responsible for preventing and eliminating sexual harassment, for addressing the effects even if those that harassment took place off campus by non-students. So the, the contrast between the responsibilities announced by the Supreme Court and OCR uh, could not be more dramatic. As a matter of fact, when uh, some schools tried to embed the Supreme Court's language in their regulations, OCR said, no, um, that you are responsible for really preventing uh, what are in fact microaggressions uh, before they become macroaggressions. Uh, and uh, so they said, you can't use the Supreme Court's language. Now, I said I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the term administrative state. Um, why? Let me give you uh, three quick reasons. One is that these regulations did not bubble up from below, from the, the alleged swamp that we are now in. Um, they came from the top. Uh, they, were, if they were emphatically endorsed by the White House, especially the Office of the Vice President, by the Attorney General, by the Secretary of Education and by the Assistant Secretary of Education for, for Civil Rights. So this was done through politically appointed and politically accountable people. Um, so th if we think that uh, the, the, the problem arises from the permanent bureaucracy, I think we're making a mistake. Um, now you could, fortunately, you could say things were done unilaterally by an administration can be undone administratively by the next administration. 
um, and uh, the Trump administration is doing this. They have withdrawn the DCL on transgender, they've withdrawn the 2011-2014 rules, but, I think it's important, but once these programs are in place, they are very hard to undo. Um, especially colleges are not going to undo these things very quickly. My second point about the difficulty of calling this the administrative state is because the courts are equally culpable here. Um, policy has been made by a process I call institutional leapfrogging, where each institution takes one small step, the other builds on it, incorporates it, um, and then takes another step so that you have this incremental growth where no one is really thinking about what this whole picture looks like. Uh, and that's one of the problems that's created by this form of policy making. Finally, um, these are not regulations that were imposed by a heavy hand on hapless educational institutions. Um, because uh, what was really going, I think a better way to look at this is that the federal regulations announced by the executive branch were really used as leverage by people within, especially universities, uh, to establish policies that they wanted all along. Um, and those of us who are in universities are always being told, you have to do this because the federal government requires it. And when you actually look back at the rules and you look back at the legislation, as I have done to the dismay of some of my, uh, the, the bureaucrats in my college, um, you find the federal government has not required that at all. Um, so this is a way as that uh, I think it's better to think of regulation as part of the coalition building that affects what goes on within educational institutions. So uh, in conclusion, what I'm saying, that we're not facing <coughs> a national bureaucratic leviathan. Um, rather, we are uh, facing a uniquely American form of soft despotism, to use Tocqueville's useful term. It is the work of many hands, but for that reason, it is particularly hard to undo. Thank you. Good afternoon. I decided to stand to make it slightly more difficult for Ted to hit me. He and I have been on several panels together. I, he's testified before the Civil Rights Commission. I think we were on a panel in at least one or two Supreme Court confirmation hearings. And we were. I think that we share the same goals. We just have different roads that we embark upon to get there. Um, one of the good things about being the last to speak is all the smart stuff has been said. So I can just kind of do a riff, which I typically do. But let me just say uh, a couple of things about the administrative state and how if the administrative state is driven in significant part, where the growth of the administrative, administrative state is driven in significant part by race and sex, then the 480 horsepower engine that drives the vehicle is, as Gail pointed out, disparate impact. If we take a look at how disparate impact came to be, the genesis, as some said, is Griggs versus Duke Power, 1971 case. And if you look at Title VII, disparate impact is nowhere to be seen. But the EEOC very shrewdly came up with a theory to help smoke out disparate treatment or intentional discrimination. It was able to convince the Supreme Court that if there's a facially neutral rule, policy, practice, regulate, whatever it may be that an employer may use, that nonetheless has a disparate impact based on a protected class. In the case of Griggs, it was black workers, then the basis for it had to be, as Ted noted, job-related pursuant to business necessity. That's an extremely, extremely high bar. And in fact, it's almost a quaint notion these days because in large part with respect to the administrative state, the whole requirement of job-relatedness has been extinguished. We have devolved into the functional equivalent, at least, of quotas. And the implementation of disparate impact has been expanded to virtually every department in the government and several standalone agencies. Going from the granddaddy of them all, the EEOC, and also the OFCCP in the employment context. 
Those of you who, like my friend John Rodabo over here, have been practicing for, well, John's a little babe in the woods, but uh, if you've been practicing for 30, 40 years, you have a common refrain that you hear from your clients with respect to disparate impact. They don't know it's about disparate impact, but if you have assisted them in navigating the shoals of an OFCCP desk audit or drafting their EEO-1 forms, affirmative action plans, the common refrain is, how do I get my numbers right? They don't want to discriminate on the basis of race, sex, age, whatever it may be, but they want to be in compliance and the agencies will happily get them into compliance, regardless of whether or not there's a job relatedness component to any perceived disparate impact. This has expanded beyond the EEOC and the OFCCP to, as some have indicated, Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights, where we have the school discipline guidance. You must have a proportionate discipline, regardless of race and sex, or you don't must, but it happens in practice. In fact, when the school discipline guidance was issued, and this is not unusual, the school district of Minneapolis issued a directive in compliance therewith to all of its administrators. Ask yourself whether or not this is a quota. The Minneapolis public schools, I'm quoting, the Min Minneapolis public school system must aggressively reduce the disproportionality between black and brown students and their white peers every year for the next four years. This will begin with a 25% reduction in disproportionality by the end of the school year, 50% by 2016, 75% by 2017, and 100% by 2018, and of course, beatings will continue until morale approves. <laughs> if that's not a quota, I don't know what is, and it's unlawful on steroids. But the expansion of this administrative state just doesn't deal with the usual suspects. We have some of the newer standalone agencies, such as the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, which modulates disparate impact on the basis of financial, the financial loan industry, whether or not loans, fees, and rates associated with therewith have a disproportionate impact pr primarily on black and Hispanic applicants. It's devolved down to the state and local level. For those of you who practice, you know that almost every substantial city has its own Human Rights Commission or Civil Rights Commission, as does every state, and they promulgate their own set of guidances and standards. Almost every department or agency has an Office of Civil Rights that deals in their own sphere with disparate impact, promulgates their own letters, guidances, rules, and regulations, and then there's a neat trick that's performed. As Chef Melnick indicated, they avoid the notice and comment under the Administrative Procedure Act, which is required under rulemaking. And in fact, there's a question as to some of these rules could even be promulgated. So instead, they use dear colleague letters, sub-regulatory guidances that have the functional equivalent effect on the intended audience of a regulation. But it doesn't stop there, because guess what? They've got not just Chevron deference, but our deference. So they can promulgate a reg, and hey, this is what it means. And courts, forget about what you think it should mean. We get to decide in large measure if it's reasonable. So this is a, uh, a stealing of not just one base, but two or three bases. And inside the park home run, if you will. Perhaps the most ambitious expansion of the administrative state under um, disparate impact theory may be of all places you would expect it, but HUD, which a couple of years ago came up with affirmatively furthering fair housing. This is by far the most expansive attempt to impose disparate impact theory on the nation as a whole. There's virtually no sphere in the country that's insulated from it because the ostensible theory behind it is that if there is a disparity in housing, if there is a racial concentration in housing that the word is deprives or has an, a, a, a disproportionate allocation of access to community assets, then 
those communities, political subdivisions, which receive federal funds for housing are compelled to come up with an analysis to how it is that you have these racial, racial concentrations, how can you dissipate them, is there an access, an equal access to community assets. Community assets means, by the way, any type of public utility, whether it be schools, transportation, access to swimming pools, parks, and housing, a broad scope of activities, and then racial engineers will approve whatever analysis that is or what plan that is. Uh, this is a, a, a very intrusive expansion of the administrative state, which I was pleased to see just a couple of days ago, some congressman wrote a letter to Ben Carson saying, we think this might be unconstitutional, take a look at it. <laughs> I would like to just, to close, quantify some of the um, expansion of the administrative state, because we've been talking about it theoretically. But when the EEOC first came into existence after the 1964 Civil Rights Act, its original budget was $19,526,000 and it had 100 employees. These are constant dollars, by the way, that I'm about to talk about. That was 1965, $19 million, 100 employees. In 1991, shortly after the Americans with Disabilities Act and the correlative uh, regs came out, it had grown to 201,930,000 in 2,796 employees. Today, it's $373 million, $887,000. Uh, $273,870,000. There's all kinds of other agencies, the uh, you know, Division of Civil Rights, the Department of Justice. It had a 50% expansion in just 14 years. OCR of HHS went from 20 million in 1998 to 39 million in 2016. Again, almost a doubling. OCR for uh, Department of Homeland Sur uh, Security, virtually the same, almost a doubling. Then we have the OFCCP. Um, probably vaguely but appropriately Soviet sounding in its name. <laughs> 1977, the budget was 15,714,000. It is now 105,476,000, a sevenfold increase. It cannot be plausibly said that we have seven times more discrimination in this country. It can't plausibly be said that the population has increased by seven or that the GDP is seven times greater than it was at the incipiency of the OFCCP. But maybe the most astonishing one was the Office of Civil Rights for the Department of Education, where in 1980 the budget was $45,847,000. In 2016 it was $107 million, which is only a little bit more than a doubling. But here's where the really interesting stats come in. If you look at the number of complaints, in 1980 they addressed 3,497 complaints, okay? Then that hovered for a couple of decades around 6,000 complaints, 6,000, several decades. Then shortly after the sexual assault and harassment guidelines, it spiked to 7,841. That's not a great spike. But then when the school discipline guideline came out, 16,720 complaints. Now, I have not disaggregated this to establish that all of this increase is necessarily a result of the school discipline guidance, but sure it's peculiar that in the first 30 years of the existence, it's around 6,000, and then boom, it goes up to 16,000. So to the extent that we agree that we want to arrive at the same place, the question really is, are we using the appropriate vehicles to get there, and are we doing so consistent with the rule of law? And I would suggest that disparate impact theory has been bastardized to the point where it hasn't been consistent with the rule of law. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to give the panelists an opportunity to respond to their fellow panelists if they'd like. I know, Mr. Shaw, you said beforehand you might want a, a chance to respond. Now, I let all of you blow way through your time on the, on the uh, initial thing, so I'm going to let you have two minutes uh, to respond, and then we can maybe have more of a discussion. Mr. Shaw, did you want to respond to anything that the other panelists said? Uh, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, given the limitations of time, uh, I can't even begin to <laughs> think about the, uh, the statistics that you just threw at us. I only point to, um, and, and there may be some, 
some meat worth um, uh, pursuing in there or chewing on. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering again what the normative assumptions are with respect to um, how uh, our, uh, our government ought to be addressing these issues. I think about HUD, for example, you mentioned HUD, um, uh, and I sit here, and I don't mean to um, make anybody uncomfortable. I probably don't have the power to do that in this room anyway. Uh, but um, uh, much of the wealth uh, in white families in this country uh, is in their homes. Um, and uh, much of that wealth was built post-World War II uh, in the process of suburbanizing America, which was done explicitly uh, with federal policies that were racially discriminatory, which froze out of the housing market uh, African Americans and other people of color, but primarily African Americans. Uh, there's a lot more that can be said about that, except that my point is, is that HUD has played, uh, not HUD, its predecessors, uh, the government, played a tremendous role, as I alluded to before, uh, in creating um, uh, economic inequality in this country, uh, equality in all kinds of sectors. We think about the relationship between housing and education and housing and um, all kinds of other factors, and it had a tremendous impact. Does HUD and the government have a role with respect to uh, fair housing and opportunities, et cetera? I think so. Uh, you know, and I'm, I wouldn't shrink from that. You may disagree. Uh, a quick word, and this is quite arbitrary, on the, uh, on the issue of, um, of school discipline policies. Uh, there's been an explosion. You talk about explosions. There's been an explosion in school discipline and a relationship with uh, what has now, I think, appropriately been called a school-to-prison pipeline when it comes to African Americans. Uh, if you disagree, fine, but at least read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. Uh, you know, I think that's an essential ingredient in having a discourse on this. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, there's been a so-called war on drugs, uh, which has been largely a war on people of color, and particularly African Americans. It's very interesting, as a lot of uh, the people are pointing out, that now we see an opioid, uh, uh, opioid crisis, we see a heroin crisis, and the discourse is completely different than it was um, when it was about African Americans who were demonized and prosecuted and imprisoned. You know, now it's about uh, you know the new drug crisis, news at uh, five o'clock, and it's not who you think, um, and it's a health crisis, et cetera. The point I'm making is is that. Uh, white folks use drugs uh, in the same proportions as African Americans, uh, with all due respect. Uh, there are a lot of white folks who are smoking dope and using cocaine, et cetera, and they are not charged, prosecuted, uh, uh, convicted, imprisoned, or imprisoned for the same length with respect to African Americans. And so when we talk about disparities, uh, and whether or not we should look at disparities as a starting point to see how we begin to take a walk toward uh, equity and equality in this country, uh, I think numbers count. It, they mean something. Uh, and the school to prison pipeline is a place to begin with respect to uh, what OCR has begun to look at um, uh, because uh, very often if you take the same 30 seconds. violation, I got it, um, <laughs> If you take the same violation of a black and a white child in school, uh, a discipline problem, very dis disparate results. Uh, again, uh, New Jim Crow. If you haven't read it already, it's required reading. All right. Peter? Yeah, um, I have read the book. And just a couple of points with respect to that. Well, the Civil Rights Commission had a hearing with respect to uh, school discipline. We are going to have another one on the, it's titled School to Prison Pipeline. With respect to the school discipline policy, again, getting your numbers right, it completely ignores the actual evidence that, in fact, black students are committing more 
disciplinary violations than their, compar their white and Asian comparatives. But there is this attempt to level the number of suspensions or to proportional, uh, into a, make them proportional. And what that does is, and we had hearings on this where school administrators in predominantly black and Hispanic schools would come in and say that um, what happens when you limit the ability to suspend because you're trying to comply with some, what I would consider to be arbitrary guideline. The people who would otherwise have been suspended remain in the schools, remain in the classrooms, continue to be disruptive, and who gets hurt? Black and Hispanic students. If you take a look at the literature on this, take a look at some of the news reports that have been emanating from urban school districts, teachers are fed up with this. They can't discipline individuals who are not just disrupting the classroom, but are criminal threats. You have parents who are upset. The good students are sitting there next to people who should have been expelled, should have been suspended, or at least given a detention. And you hear often, okay, I have no statistics on the top of my head, but you hear copious anecdotal information about how students are afraid, teachers have been beat up, they're afraid to go to school. How can you learn in that kind of environment? I live in inner city Cleveland. You have the same kind of construct in inner city Cleveland. Thankfully, I had the wherewithal to send my kids to a parochial school. They would never be going to the school that's right next to my uh, house. Not going to happen because they wouldn't be learning there. This is, this, it's, it's just sheer lunacy. I'm not saying that it's wrong not to look at these things. The manner in which it was implemented is boneheaded. All right, Gail. Um, I want to make a couple of comments here. One, I want to add a little bit to what Pete said about the school discipline issue. Uh, in fact, uh, Allison Soman, who is in the audience right now, and I have just almost finished, a couple of footnotes to go, uh, an article on school discipline that I think deals uh, in part um, with the empirical literature out there. And I think what Pete is saying is basically accurate here. If you look at the empirical studies, um, they are, are quite ideological. Um, and for example, you'll get, get, get um, cases where um, students are being compared at different schools for dress code violations. Well, at like New Trier uh, High School in Illinois, that means like, you know, a student was wearing a blouse that was just a little too low cut. Um, in an inner city school, it can mean gang insignias. Um, and these are very different kinds of violations. Um, you know, this is a hugely important issue. Uh, if students at more, with more disadvantaged backgrounds uh, are forced to be in a classroom with disruptive students, they are not going to learn. So this is not one of these topics that we can just blow off as somebody else's problem. Uh, this is something the Trump administration needs to look extremely close at. Um, a couple of other things I wanted to say about what Ted said. Ted, I was thinking when you were speaking that you are just the perfect progressive. Much greater faith in the ability of an administrative agency to figure out what is business necessity. Uh, that is to, to figure out why the employer has made a goof about the employer's own business, uh, I think, than the typical conservative is. But it was interesting then in your later comments, you were talking about how dangerous the federal government had been just post-war uh, with regard to housing issues. You know, but like from our standpoint, I think in the room here, you got to watch the federal government with your hat and coat all the time. Um, and so, so it, it's, it's just, we just don't have the faith in the ability of, of, of somebody at the EEOC to decide on business necessity, which after all is a fairly high standard. Uh, the high water mark in that, that case was, was Albemarle Paper, uh, which was a case where the employer had actually hired an industrial psychologist to come in and verify that, that, that the tests they were using were in fact getting them better employees. And this was rather sophisticated statistical analysis and the court said not good enough you basically have to have scientific evidence well like if I'm running a shoe store and the shoe store you know I I'm the manager of the shoe store and I have this idea that like more polite shoe salesmen will make more sales well I can't prove it I don't have an industrial psychologist to prove it you know about a decade later the Supreme Court tried to cut back on that standard and get to something that was a little bit more usable but Congress turned around and overruled them again so right now we don't really know what the standard is other than the obvious business necessity sounds pretty tough to me 
Um, and no, I do not trust the EEOC to be able to judge uh, the business necessity for every different business across the country. I don't think that's possible, and I don't think we can ever expect uh, the federal government to be able to apply such a standard fairly. Gail, I oh, just want to show one more you. thing, just one more thing. Uh, the viciousness point seconds. about North Carolina, I bet you're right on that. I bet it is. But don't come to California if you are looking for non-vicious <laughs> state politics. Okay. It's, things are bad all over. Professor Melnick. I just wanted to show you that I, I'm not a perfect anything, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just very quickly, I think there's no, there's no doubt in my mind that we are failing black school children. No doubt in my mind. And that is the responsibility of government at all level for the reasons that Ted uh, laid out. The question I would ask is, are any of these regulations coming from the Department of Education making the education we provide to school children, especially minority school children, better or worse? And one of the real dangers of working through very sweeping law rules issued without any type of rulemaking procedure, is that we never ask that question. So I hope that when we start uh, anew, that we will start asking that question of what is actually providing a better education to those people who have been very poorly served in the past. All right, well, I'm, there are a lot of people in the crowd, and I know that Gail needs to leave a little earlier than the end time of this panel, so let's go to audience questions now. Liz, what is the procedure for the, the questions? We have a microphone here. Is that the only microphone, or is there, is there another one? I guess there are two microphones. So here, here are my rules for questions. Uh, one, it's got to be a question. No speeches. I will cut you off. Um, secondly, uh, I think it's in the traditions of, of the Federalist Society to have civil discourse, so while we uh, embrace uh, strong views, they should be expressed civilly. I won't tolerate any uh, snarkiness or uh, berating of any panelists from any perspective. So with that, uh, I'll start here in, in the front. Right. Uh, Ted, I, I wanted to ask, we spoke mostly of the administrative state in its role, uh, in, its role in prevention. Uh, but but in, in, the, in the success of education, we, we, we got almost to the role of provision. And I, I've heard John McWhorter, of course, express a difference about the continuum that the, that the great society, you know, kind of intervened in the continuum and, and, and that, that now there's a, there's a commingling of the efforts to fix the problem with the problem. And I, I'm wondering if you, if you have faith in the, in the administrative state on the, on the provision side or whether you actually have concerns that, that, uh, that efforts to fix this could do more harm. Well, first, um, I'm not sure that I said, or I characterize what I'm saying as having faith in the administrative state. What I say is that there is a role uh, for government uh, in um, uh, countering discrimination, uh, in leavening out some of the inequality. Uh, so that's my starting point. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things that government does badly. There's some things that it can do, whether it does it well or not. Uh, it, if, if government doesn't have a role, then a lot of this isn't going to get done. Uh, as I said before, my experience, and you all, I, I welcome you to come back at me. My experience is that, for the most part, in this country, racial inequality, to the extent that it has been addressed, has not been addressed as a consequence of leadership in the private sector. Uh, that's not to say that the private sector hasn't stepped up once the government began to change standards, set standards, et cetera. And the country has changed, and, and the culture of the ch country has changed, although it's kind of going through another change, uh, I think maybe in the wrong direction. Uh, but so the point I'm making is that, or I'm trying to make, is that uh, to the extent that people talk about uh, the government as if it's uh, completely evil and has no place in countering inequality or racial discrimination, I part company with folks who take that view. Uh, is it uh, going to do it with anything close to perfection? No. Um, but after all of these years and years and years uh, of uh, created inequality in this country, the idea that we can walk away from that and just say, 
government hands off, no role, uh, this will fix itself, or the private sector will, will fix it. I don't have faith in that. Thank you. In the back. To Jay Schweiker at Cato Institute. Um, Mr. Shaw, I appreciated your sort of uh, emphasis on kind of taking a step back and looking at what, what our fundamental values are and what you know, we think our priorities are here. And I think that's important to keep track of as opposed to getting lost in sort of a lot of the technical details. Uh, in that vein, my question for you is, you ask, you know, what is, what is it that people are afraid of by you know, asking whether uh, practices have a business necessity? And, and I sort of, you know, to answer a question with a question, do you think that it's a common occurrence that there would be practices that an employer would adopt without any discriminatory intent? I mean, an honest, honestly adopted, that they might be wrong about, that there might be honest mistakes that people make that in fact don't serve business necessity, but, like, but are not a, a, adopted with intent to discriminate. And so is the, is, the funct, is, the, is the goal here simply to ferret out actual discrimination when you can't prove it with a smoking gun, or is it in effect to require all employers to affirmatively use re good business practices? And is that what we actually want the EEOC uh, determining when they uh, enforce Title VII? So I, I thank you for that. And um, the, the sh my short answer to that is that, of course, uh, there are honest mistakes made every day. We all make them. Uh, and I don't think that, um, that uh, businesses, business owners, employers ought to be held liable if we're thinking about liability as the outcome or a standard for honest mistakes. What I think we're talking about, at least what I want to talk about, and I think the policies that were adopted with respect to disparate impact, um, uh, the, I think the intention was to identify practices and policies that needlessly um, uh, replicate, reinforce, and reify uh, inequality, first on lines of race, but you're right that it's expanded to gender and all kinds of other uh, areas. Uh, my focus primarily has been on race. Um, and so the question I asked earlier, I don't quite get um, why that inquiry makes people uh, uncomfortable. Uh, is there a cost uh, at times? Uh, yes, there's a cost uh, with respect to almost everything and anything that we do. Um, but it goes back to the values, uh, shared values that you're talking about and a determination of what they are. Um, so uh, uh, am I making sense to you? I mean, you may disagree, but, but that's what I think we're trying to do or should be trying to do. Uh, if there's an unnecessary and unjustifiable disparate impact and there's another way to do it, we ought to be asking questions about that and seeing if we can pursue that. And I, th I mean, just the implication, I think, is that what you're saying is that it is the job of Title VII to go past intentional discrimination and to get at, as you say, practices that needlessly discriminate or have needlessly have a disparate impact, even if that impact was n nowhere, you know, within the mind or intent of the person deciding on it. Um, uh, that is what the law um, grew to do, is to try to get employers to think about um, what they were doing uh, that had discriminatory impact uh, unnecessarily. And if that's the question you're asking, whether I'm comfortable with that, the answer is yes, I am. Uh, I think it's worth doing that. Any Can I comment again? on that sure. a little bit too? I think a good example of the perverse uh, side of this uh, is with the criminal background checks. Um, and, you know, again, knock me over with a feather if Congress intended to prevent employers uh, from considering someone's actual record. I mean, the whole point of Title VII, and it was said repeatedly uh, in 1964 by members of Congress, our whole point is that we want employers to be making decisions based on the, person, the individual's actual record rather than on their race, color, uh, religion, sex, or national origin. And with criminal background checks, you know, if if uh, Griggs and, and disparate impact liability in general were intended simply to, to ferret out actual discrimination, then you'd have an affirmative defense that would allow the employer to show, look, you know, you might have a, might find me presumptively in violation of Title VII because I've, I've done something that has a disparate impact, but I can show you, on, you know, based on evidence that that was not my intent. But with something like criminal background checks, what happens is that you can get a perverse effect, and that is if an employer is thinking, like, I'm going to get in trouble if I actually 
ask about criminal background, but maybe that person in the back of their mind is thinking African Americans are more likely to have criminal criminal records than, than Asian Americans. And so when two employees, uh, then two job applicants come in um, and the employer says, oh, I can't ask about criminal record without you know, getting in trouble with the EEOC. You know, it's really complicated guidance. I can't figure it out. I'm not going to consider um, asking them. I'm just going to hire the Asian. There it is. Uh, and that's what they do. Uh, there is not a lot of empirical evidence on this, but there's some. Um, and I, I think it's a, a real worry, particularly in the area of, of criminal background checks. You don't want a situation where people go back to using race as a proxy uh, for qualifications um, that they feel like they can't ask about. You know, actual things that matter like criminal record, and criminal record does matter, uh, I think need to be asked about. And again, I support tax deductions uh, for people who are willing to hire somebody um, who has a, a criminal criminal record, I think it's a good thing. I think that little, little, little extra thing helps integrate um, former felons back into the mainstream, and that's a good thing, but that should be regardless of race, um, and it shouldn't be forcing employers to take chances that in their best judgment shouldn't be taken. To be clear, nobody in his or her right mind uh, thinks that uh, we should be hiring people with uh, records of, of uh, abusing children sexually uh, in daycare centers or, um, you know, other people who have uh, criminal violations um, being hired in jobs for which they clearly um, uh, have engaged in conduct which make them a clear and present danger. But what we're talking about in America right now, and I will not walk away from this, uh, is a criminal justice system with vast inequality, largely driven by a war on drugs, which has incarcerated, um, uh, you know, millions of African Americans for nonviolent offenses. I'm not talking about violence. Uh, you know, there's some people who need time out, you know, who need to be incarcerated. But I'm talking about people who have engaged in nonviolent conduct. Uh, and that conduct is replicated in white communities, and at least up until now, people aren't treated in the same way. Uh, you may say as a matter of principle uh, that uh, you think that this issue of, of criminal background checks um, is not an issue. Uh, let's see what happens in another 10 or 15 years when the opi opioid crisis or the heroin crisis in white communities uh, I mean, let's see if it, in fact, ends up with the incarceration and criminal records of millions and tens of millions of white Americans. Uh, and uh, what the impact is with respect to our practices in hiring and elsewhere in 10, 15 years. Uh, I think I know where that might be going. Uh, perhaps I'm wrong. But I am not going to sit back uh, and I, you disagree with me. Um, but I think we have to address where we can um, the impact of the policies that we pursued that have needlessly created all of this inequity over the last 15, 20, or 30 years. That's where I'm coming from. Peter wants to respond. Yeah, just very quickly. It, I think it's um, a testament to the pernicious effect of the administrative state that here at the Federal Society we've assumed or we're presuming uh, a certain position that is devoid of the fundamental notion of freedom in the first instance. Uh, somebody mentioned Tocqueville, and if I get the quote correctly, it's, he says that the species of oppression by which democratic nations is menaced is unlike anything which ever before existed in the world. It does not tyrannize, but it enervates, extinguishes, and stupefies the people until each nation becomes no, nothing more than a flock of timid animals of which the government is the shepherd. We should be very concerned about an administrative state untethered to the rule of law as we properly understand it. Ted's right. Blacks historically were suspicious of the government because the government was the engine by which blacks were oppressed. Now it's purportedly doing so in a benign fashion, in a well-intended fashion. But the EEOC background check, Gail promised I would talk about it, uh, so I, I may as well do so. 
Uh, the ELC background check is one example of how the government does something backwards. There are now at least three studies that suggest precisely what Gail said. Now, I will say that these studies are somewhat inconclusive, but each one shows that when deprived of the ability to use metrics such as crim uh, involvement in crime, or at least restrained in doing so, employers resort to illegitimate reasons to deny somebody a job because they come up with the stereotypic explanations. I'm gonna hire the Asians because I know generally Asians aren't involved in, cl in crime, but I watch TV and I see black faces all over the place. So what we've seen is those employers that hew to criminal background checks more rigorously are more likely to decline employment to blacks and Hispanics. Again, the government now, as opposed to in the past, may be well-intended, outcome almost the same. No, that's an exaggeration, but the outcome is adverse to the intended beneficiaries. Okay, I'd like to go to the next uh, audience question, unless Professor Melvick, yes. do you have anything to add? Okay, go ahead. In, ter in terms of the discussion on uh, disparate impact in school discipline, um, I'm curious why uh, OCR of the Department of Education doesn't seem very concerned about um, the disparate impact between uh, white students and Asian students. I was wondering about that too. Well, <laughs> is, there a, is there any explanation to that? And, or and or, so, or, or that boys be, and girls, I mean, it's... it's Gail, do you want to elaborate if, on what, if the what, assumption, what the If the assumption is that any difference, uh, you know, dif disparate impact is usually a result of discrimination, uh, then wouldn't, uh, by OCR's own standards, wouldn't they be denying uh, certain groups, students' civil rights by failing to investigate um, that disparity? No, you, you and I are thinking just alike here, um, and that is well, that Could I get Ted to respond then? <laughs> <laughs> I suspected that you might be aiming at it. <laughs> Um, look, um, you know, I, in answering that, I think about Stuyvesant High School in New York. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Stuyvesant High School. Um, Stuyvesant is the absolutely best public high school in New York City and one of the best in the country. It is overwhelmingly Asian American um, in its student enrollment. Um, uh, and what's not, uh, not Asian American is primarily white. Um, a great school. Uh, there are all kinds of reasons that Asian Americans, uh, and many of them immigrants, um, uh, do well on standardized tests that we could talk about or do better on standardized tests. Um, uh, Stuyvesant, by the way, uses uh, standardized tests as the sole measure of qualifications uh, you know, for admission. Uh, if you go to standardized test makers and you ask them uh, whether or not that test should be used that way, if you put, they'll, they'll go all the way to the bank on it if nobody confronts them on it. But if you ask them, they'll say, that's an improper use of a standardized test. Uh, it ought to be used in conjunction with many other measures. And so, um, you know, when I was at the Legal Defense Fund, before I left, I authorized an investigation into Stuyvesant High School because there are virtually no African-American students, even if they are um, good, strong students, you know, at Stuyvesant. Um, so, uh, here's the thing. You do have these, um, these differences um, that exist. There's no question about it. They exist out in your state, Gail, uh, particularly in the higher education system. And you know that white parents uh, at one point began to complain about UCLA and, some of, and, and I think Berkeley also because they were disproportionately unpresent. Um, as those schools became more and more Asian American, there hasn't been a tremendous interest, you know, in that issue. Um, do I think, would I shrink from OCR or somebody else looking into those issues? Uh, no, I wouldn't shrink from it. Um, but I think that there's some very important parameters and policy questions and facts that we need to look into when we ask about or what's going on there and whether it really constitutes the kind of discrimination that we've been concerned about uh, with respect to race. And so I just, imperfect answer, 
Uh, I'd be glad to engage with you more on that if you'd like. We can talk afterwards and exchange contact, okay? Chef, go ahead. I just want to uh, add a, a comment about the way in which the discussion here has generally gone, which is um, we're arguing whether government has a legitimate role in these areas. Should we have more government or less? I don't think any of us believe that the federal government doesn't have a legitimate role in preventing various types of discrimination. Uh, I don't think that any of us think that the federal government should not be enforcing Title IX. As a matter of fact, I'd say that probably in some ways Title IX is one of the biggest successes of government policy that we can think of. Um, when you look at the change in the role of women in education from the 1960s to today, um, the truth is that government played some role in opening the door to, of educational opportunity to women, and boy did they rush through. The real problem now is the guys are doing so poorly. And that's really a serious problem. Um, but the question is, how do you do this well? And what I would say about, surprising about uh, Title IX is, as women have done better and better, regulation has gotten heavier and heavier. Um, and I would say that it's part because we've entered new areas. We're trying not just to eliminate barriers to educational opportunity, but to change the way that the public thinks about sex, quite frankly. Um, and I often think of it as kind of government regulators can do very good job many times, but like the boy who tried to spell Mississippi, just didn't know when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the question at the back and then the question at the front. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, Ted, this question is for you. Um, I, uh, I'm an immigrant from Kingston, Jamaica. And uh, back in 87, the Miami Herald did an analysis of the income, ethnic income across the board in Miami. And one of the things they found was that Jamaicans had a higher income than, um, than most other, uh, it was ranked second, actually, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, study. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about is the HUD situation. Because coming from the islands and trying to get uh, housing, uh, you're pretty much starting off at zero. So you, you all probably know the, the, the idea that Jamaicans will work three, four jobs, but it's so that they can get money to get what they want, you know? Let, let's get to the question. So the question I have for you is, what do you think the difference is between HUD recipients and uh, for people, for example, Jamaicans that would not get involved with HUD, but would rather work two, three jobs so they could buy their own house? What, what are your thoughts on that? I'm not sure what all of the assumptions um, are that underlie the question uh, with respect to who's willing to work hard and who isn't. Um, yes, I've heard about Jamaicans working two or three jobs, and uh, it reminds me about uh, the conversation that we just slightly touched on with respect to why Asian Americans are doing better and on standardized tests and getting into Stuyvesant, for example. You know, many of them, I say, immigrant families whose uh, sometimes the income may be $27,000 to $30,000 a year, and they may spend tremendous amounts of uh, their income, a tremendous proportion to have their children uh, take these, um, these, uh, these classes on how to take standardized exams, and they make tremendous sacrifices, et cetera. Um, I understand that cultural phenomenon. There are differences with respect to immigrants generally. Um, I'm not sure I see a relationship between comparing, um, you know, I think you, you're talking about HUD recipients, or et cetera, um, and immigrants, uh, and hard work. HUD has played a role. The federal government has played a role. I've said this repeatedly now. The forerunner, the FHA, Federal Housing Administration, played a tremendous role in creating wealth in uh, post-World War II America for white families. Uh, you know, nobody questioned how or uh, whether they worked hard uh, or whether they were um, uh, uh, worthy recipients, uh, et cetera. Um, the fact is, is that nonetheless, um, the government played a role uh, in all of this and concomitantly played a role with respect to impoverishing or perpetuating the impover impoverishment of black Americans. And so we could spend a lot of time talking about how black America has come to look the way it did. And yes, a part of that conversation can be a discussion about 
immigrants, et cetera. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I, look, I take my hat off to people who work hard. I resist the assumption that black Americans who have been here for generations uh, and some of them who may look to, um, uh, to HUD, governmental programs, et cetera, that they don't work hard, you know. Um, Black Americans have worked hard in this country for a long time in subordinated positions and made little wealth in doing it. And so uh, I'll stop there. Go ahead. Great. Um, How you doing? <laughs> um, President Melnick, this is for you, but the other panelists may feel free to uh, weigh in. Um, in your um, remarks, you mentioned uh, in respect to Title IX, the phrase separate but equal, um, aren't equal with respect to sex. Um, this uh, brought to mind that there seems to be a commingling, uh, conflation of uh, race and sex as far as discrimination. It does seem like there's a piggybacking of the, the Civil Rights you know, Act and um, you know, the whole process with other classifications. Um, I was wondering, because uh, it does seem that blacks and whites is really fundamentally no real differences between the two, whereas uh, sex is a biological fact. So number one, do you agree with that that premise, if so, um, would we have a Title IX in its current form if there were no slavery leading up to a Civil Rights Act? Sure. Uh, to say that uh, sex is a biological distinction is a highly controversial point these days. <laughs> not here. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> Let's not play games. Uh, uh. But your, your larger point, I think, is really important, which is that I, mean, I have fully uh, support Title IX because I think it's really done a great, great things for opening doors of opportunity for women, um, which has been you know, just unleash enormously valuable energy and ability. But I do think that the history of civil rights legislation in this country, I'll put it quite, that um, many other groups have been borrowing from the moral legitimacy um, of black Americans. Um, and I would say that, that black Americans face a unique problem. And I always tell my students, you can't be somewhat unique. If you're unique, you're unique, right? And the problem of black Americans is unique. Um, and all too often, we have overlooked the ways in which these other distinct uh, areas of civil rights, whether it be disability, or, uh, or sex, or sexual orientation, um, or um, uh, uh, ethnicity, which often is related to immigration. Um, the key differences between those. And I'll just say that I mean, one of the uh, things that people forget about Title IX is it makes lots and lots of exceptions. It says you, that private colleges can discriminate on the basis of, of sex. We don't say that about, uh, 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 about race. Um, we don't say that you can have separate black and white teams. We would all, all be repelled by that. Um, but we, there are important differences here. And I'll just add one other thing. Here's an area where I think we should take more, pay more attention to disparate impact. Maybe Ted and I are in agreement on this, which is when you look at the people who have been accused of sexual harassment and sexual assault on college campuses, they are vastly disproportionately black men. Um, and I think we've had a long and ugly enough history of accusations of sexual misconduct by black men to make us worry about that. Would anybody on the panel like a, a last word? Since I see no other questions from the audience. Gail, any, any last uh, thoughts? I think I'll pass. Okay, <laughs> Chef, anything else? Ted? I'm good. Peter, okay, great. 